Okay, so today we're going to be discussing correlation. To illustrate correlation, consider our standard scatter plot, something we've talked briefly about previously. Of course, in our kind of scatter plot, we have two variables. Uh, why don't we call them like, I don't know, maybe time spent working out and how much one can lift up, or how much one can bench. Each one of these dots represents the element in our data set. In this particular case, each one of these dots represents a person. And that particular person has spent a certain amount of time working out and can bench press or lift a certain amount of pounds. Now we can see from this scatter plot that these two things kind of run together. It's noisy, right? There are some people that spend very little time working out and can bench press a lot. In this example, there are some people that spend a fair amount of time working out but still can't bench press that much. But there is generally a that these variables seem to run together. And how these variables run together is what we call correlation. Or when one variable changes, how does the other variable change? In this particular example, these variables are positively correlated. When one increases, the other increases. When one decreases, the other decreases. They could, though, be negatively correlated. Variables can be negatively correlated. Variables change in opposite directions. As one increases, the other decreases. As one decreases, the other increases. Positive correlation. Maybe this is how much time you spend working out and how much you weigh. Obviously, if you work out a lot, you build muscle mass, muscle mass can get pretty heavy, but generally speaking, as people work out more, they weigh less. Negative correlation. Now, there's a certain level of strength to correlation. Like, this seems pretty strongly correlated, right? It, it forms a pretty tightness. There's not a lot of noise there. This is a lot noisier. It's a weaker correlation, right? Values are sort of all over the map. I can make it even weaker if I want. I'm just adding some more out there. How strong or how weak correlation uh, is, is measured by something called the correlation coefficient. It can be anywhere from a positive one, which is perfect positive correlation. Uh, one way to imagine that positive one is you could draw a line through all the data points, and it would be an upward sloping line. It could be kind of flat, it could be really steep as long as it's sloping upward and it hits every observation, that is perfect positive correlation. You can also go negative one or perfect negative correlation, where if you draw a straight downward sloping line, it would hit every observation. The correlation coefficient can never be greater than one, and it can never be less than negative one. It's always bounded between these. Usually in practice, you will never see something that's exactly positive one if you do it's pretty boring or you did something weird. Similarly, if you ever see something that's negative one, you probably just did something weird. Uh, in practice, there's always gonna be something in between them. Zero, zero means there's no correlation at all. It's just a mess of points. If you were to draw a line you uh, would not really be able to get any meaningful result. A line that's downward sloping would look just as useful as a line that's upward sloping. Here's a picture of uh, the ranges of some of these correlation coefficients. You can see the positive one looks like a upward sloping line, and the negative one is a downward sloping line. And the zero in the middle is just a mess. It's just like a dot where the individual points really don't indicate a correlation at all. But when you look at the positive 0.4, it 
you, you see a little bit of a positive correlation there. And then when uh, you see a positive 0.8, you see an even clearer, stronger correlation, a positive correlation. And it's the same thing with a negative. You see a negative 0.4, a weak negative correlation, and then a negative 0.8, a strong negative correlation. Now I say weak and I say strong. There really aren't hard, fast rules on what's weak, what's strong, but it's more a part of the language of statistics, we talk about weak correlations and strong correlations. Noisy correlations sometimes indicate a, a weak correlation. But we like noisy because noisy indicates there's other things going on. Like, take a common correlation, age and height. Now granted, this isn't a super great correlation when you get into your 20s or 30s or 40s. But for school-age kids, there is a very clear, and I would say relatively strong correlation between age and height. But there's some noise, there's some other factors besides age that determine height. Things like genetics, right? My kids are very tall for their age, as I am tall. Uh, things like diet, too, can impact it. So when you start thinking about other things that matter for one variable, then you lose some of that strong relationship. And if so many things matter that the, the variable is completely drowned out, like if we're talking about age not in the school age range, but in something that's more like from the 20s or 30s or 40-year-olds, there shouldn't be any correlation at all. Just because you're 20 doesn't mean you're going to be shorter than someone who's 30. and doesn't mean you're shorter than someone who's 40. No correlation here. So many other things matter at that point, and age really doesn't matter at all. You know, you, once you hit your height, you're basically done. Uh, that, no correlation. But for school-age kids, for young kids, a very strong correlation. Not perfect, because other things matter. It's a little noisy, but not that noisy. Now, when we see correlations, people typically then want to make a connection. In this case, it's logical, right? Uh, age causes height, but it doesn't have to be. Like, for example, if we turn now to the element being countries, and we would plot countries uh, education level you know the average number of school of, uh, years of schooling that citizen might have uh, if they're at least age 25 or older so average years of schooling on one axis and then how old they're expected to live on another axis we would get a positive correlation what does that mean in this case does that mean that if people get smarter, that causes them to live longer? Maybe that they're smart enough to avoid uh, problems that could cause them to die, or they're more likely to wash their hands, and what? maybe that's what's going on? Or is it because that if people are expected to live longer, then they are more willing to invest in education? Because if you expect to live to your 80s, then you are more likely to go through four or five years of school because you'll have more of your life after that to live. Well, if, you only, if you're expected to die at the age of 30 or 40, then you're less likely to go to school, less likely to do a lot of that work on, on building skills because it's the point you're gonna die soon. So is it life expectancy causing education? Is it education causing life expectancy? Here's the thing to remember about correlation. You don't know. Correlation does not mean causation. People will often pick two variables that show a correlation, and then they'll immediately assume that that must mean one thing is causing the other. It's not so simple. There's two problems that can occur. One is that whatever you think is going on, the other thing is actually happening. So for example, there's a strong correlation between how much money 
uh, people make on average in a country and uh, how much CO2 emissions that country has per person. Does that mean that if you emit more CO2, people earn more? Like if you just start burning forests down, that would emit a lot of CO2 and that causes people to earn more? Not likely. That would be an example of reverse causation because what makes more sense is that when people earn more money, that process of them earning more money and the result of them having more money causes them to do things that result in more CO2 emissions. If people are wealthy of countries, or make, if uh, average income goes up in a country, then people are more willing to buy cars, uh, they're using more electricity, these things cause CO2 emissions. So be careful of reverse causation. Reverse causation, mixing up which variable is the cause, the causal variable, the thing that's causing stuff, and which variable is the effect. Sometimes you might refer to these two as the uh, independent variable, the causal variable, and the dependent variable, the effect, because the dependent variable depends on the independent variable. The dependent variable is the effect. Sometimes reverse causation is very clear. Like if we have one variable that is how much how much education a person has, and the other variable is how much education their parents had. Clearly, it is not possible for the person's education to cause their parents' education because their parents' education happened before they were educated, before they were even born in some cases. The only one that if you were to draw a direct connection here, it would have to be because the parents' education causes their kids' education. That's the only way to make it make sense. Right? You can't time travel. So sometimes it's very clear people are making a reverse causation error. Um, others are not so clear. Greater causation emissions cause people to earn more. I mean, maybe you might think that, but then you think about it a little bit more and you realize, no, it's really the other way around. A subtler problem, a subtler problem is the confounded variable. Before we had life expectancy and education. Is it education causing life expectancy? Is it life expectancy ca causing education? That's very hard to tell. But what if it's neither? What if it's some third thing? Maybe income is causing both. If people in a country make more money, then they have more resources to be able to invest in healthcare, to be able to take care of themselves, to be able to afford better sanitation, and that causes them to live longer. And if people make more money, then they have the ability to set aside more of their time, especially for their kids' time, to not earn money and build your education. You know, the fact that people delay so much of like their earning potential or so many, um, so many years not making money uh, in order to learn things, it's a sign of, of a wealthy society. So it's not that these two variables are actually directly related, that if you increase one, that increases the other, or vice versa. It's that there is some third, it is that there is, it is that there is some third thing that causes them both independently. The classic example of this is ice cream and crime. When people eat a lot of ice cream, there is also a lot of crime. Does that mean that ice cream causes crime, that people get hopped up on sugar and start like murdering people and stealing things? Probably not. It's because that people love ice cream so much that uh, they decide to start committing crimes and then as they commit crimes, they get money and then they use it to spend ice cream. And so ice cream consumption goes up. And they're motivated by Ben and Jerry's. No, that doesn't make sense either. So why then are ice cream sales and criminal activity so positively correlated? It's because weather causes them both. 
As weather heats up, people eat more ice cream. And completely independent of that, as the weather warms up, people are more willing to commit crimes. Right? Crime rates do indeed go up during the summer. Maybe because there's more daylight hours, at the very least, it's a lot more pleasant to pick a lock when it's warm than when it's cold. Right? So this is a confounding variable. Some, uh, it's a variable which directly causes two other variables. It's that, it's that third thing that you didn't think about. This happens a lot. This is actually much more common than reverse causation. With the reverse causation, you see the two options ahead of you. You can just imagine what if one thing is causing the other and vice versa. Confounding variable there is trickier to detect because you have to think of the third thing that isn't listed there. So I can pick it from a menu. Think about what other things could cause X and could those things also at the same time independently be causing Y? What other things could be causing Y, and then at the same time, could they also be causing X? So remember, correlation is not causation. But don't be stupid about it. While it's true, correlation is not the same thing as causation, that doesn't mean that they're completely unrelated. It doesn't mean that just because you see two variables that are correlated, that means that they can't possibly be connected. Consider this XKCD comic. I used to think correlation implied causation. Then I took a statistics class. Now I don't. Sounds like the class helped. Well, maybe. Yes, time spent studying statistics is positively correlated with statistics knowledge. That doesn't mean that they're not connected though. Like there's a good story you can tell that would suggest why one causes the other. Why, if you spend more time studying something, you are more likely to know more about it. That's, don't be, don't be stupid about this. This is an important idea, but don't be stupid about it. You need a story. You need some logic or reasoning to explain why these two things are connected, right? When I tried to tell that story about like why ice cream is connected with with with, with crime like it doesn't make any sense like those those were, those were ridiculous like, that's what makes them great examples for confounding variables but we can tell a reasonable story for why say time spent goofing off has a negative correlation with exam grade we can tell that story. We can tell the story for why time spent goofing off has a negative correlation with exam grade. We can't just say, oh, those are strongly correlated. Therefore, I guess that doesn't mean anything. No, of course it means something. It, it, of course this makes sense. It makes sense that if you spend less time studying and, and more time just like goofing off and not doing anything, playing video games or whatever, then you are going to learn less and you will not do as well on exams. You need a narrative. You need a reason for why one thing would cause another. If he had learned, for example, in that class that, uh, say, North Korea is an oppressive dictatorship which puts disgruntled citizens in concentration camps, that would probably just be a coincidence if his knowledge of North Korea, uh, of North Korean politics, increased as he learned more statistics. I don't really see an inherent connection there, right? Most classes don't really talk about North Korean politics. At least most statistics classes don't talk about North Korean politics. So that would be a reasonable, like, oh, that's probably like a weird coincidence. That I happen to be studying stuff on North Korea, maybe some other class, maybe I was just curious. Uh, it's not really connected with statistics. But clearly, the idea that correlation does not mean causation is something that's covered in every introductory statistics class. Okay, let's talk about measuring. So if you go to my website and you pull up data set four. Okay, we're going to enable editing. This is country data. I don't know why it's all the way down here. Let's go all the way up. So the element is the country. We have 
dozen scores over over 200 countries represented here with a bunch of different variables what we're going to be talking about now is actually doing the correlation coefficient there's of course an equation for it uh, no one calculates it by hand because it's just too labor intensive and excel has it built in so why would you do it by hand anyway so let's figure out some correlations um do we suppose that more populated countries are wealthier or that they tend to have higher incomes so we have population right here, and we have GDP per capita right here. Let's see if there's any correlation. You know, as a side note, we could tell a reasonable story for why it would be. Like, if there's a larger population, that means there's greater potential for specialization of labor. And if you know your wealth of nations, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, as I'm sure all of you do, classic economics uh, book, most important economics book, uh, he describes how specialization leads to greater, greater wealth right? because you get better and better by doing that one thing, and that's more efficient. And so people get wealthier. Let's figure out. Let's figure out. There's a connection here between population and GDP per capita. So the secret, of course, I'm just going to pick a random blank cell. Uh, there's a lot of blank cells in, in this area right here. So let's just do correlate. Oh, look, there it is. Now, correlation involves two different variables. So we are going to have to put in two different variables, two different arrays. And I'm going to go ahead and highlight population. It's going all the way down. Insert a comma. And then go right next door to the GDP per capita section. Now, I don't want to include, remember, I don't want to include this first line here, this first row. Oh, because that's not that's just a title that's not actually a variable that's not um that's there's no data there and what i get i get a very not even a low number if it would be a low number at least that would be interesting there's no correlation at all here it's, yes granted it's not exactly zero but it's pretty darn close to zero it's functionally zero as a side note this doesn't mean that this story of specialization is wrong there's so much international trade now that you can specialize in one thing and still be able to pull off of the wealth of other countries. All right. There's also a lot of other factors that determine if a country is wealthy or not, like its institutions and so forth, its rules, its structure of government. So it's just so many other things that are, that are mattering here. And our story of greater division of labor um, might be kind of irrelevant in a world of globalized trade that that's probably why we're not getting a correlation coefficient of, of any sort of correlation at all so it's it, it's not exactly zero but it's functionally zero well let's look at another one let's look at another one uh, go ahead and double click it and we double click we can see now we can if you mouse over the red area for example or the blue area you can then move things around and not not in the middle of it but along that line. Let's take this blue one, this blue square, so we can get the, that, that crossbar right there. See that cross? And we're gonna click it and we're gonna drag it over to population density. Hey, maybe there's a connection. Speaking of division of labor, maybe it's maybe it's just something, maybe we're just not measuring the right thing. You know, maybe if it's a really big country, people are really spread out. Uh, maybe if we do population density. At least then they're kind of near each other so they can specialize and trade with one another. And when we hit yes, now we get something that's 0.23. Uh, that is at least positive. It's not a zero correlation. It's something that's positive. It's something that's certainly worthwhile. It's kind of worth paying attention to, but it's also pretty weak. It's pretty noisy, which we shouldn't be totally surprised by. There's lots of other things that matter for both of these. So maybe there can be a very low population density country, but it's don't might be pretty wealthy uh, because maybe the population within the country are concentrated in a few areas and there's just a lot of empty space. Okay. In a lot of ways, the United States is like that. The United States is a very wealthy country, but there's a lot of empty space in this country. 
a lot of empty space. If you live on the coast or you live in a major urban area, it probably doesn't seem that way. But as someone who's driven all over this country, all over the United States, it's a very um, it's a very empty country. A lot of a lot of parts of it, especially out west. So we get a little bit of a correlation. Man, it's kind of fun to see all these different correlations. It would be nice, though, if we could get all the correlations. Like that was just two. Maybe we're curious about, say, I don't know, GDP and murder. Oh, look at that. It's negative. Negative 0.42. So not only is it negative, it's a strong correlation than before. Just as we were as intuition would suggest wealthier countries tend to be have less murder or maybe countries with less murder tend to be wealthier right or maybe some third thing right? and we don't want to imply we don't want to be too eager to draw causation without some careful thought but a relatively reasonable negative correlation that was kind of neat it would be nice if we could get, though, all the correlations, all the correlation coefficients at once. GDP per capita for murder, GDP per capita for agri agricultural land, GDP per capita for a given. We can do population density for agricultural land, population density for murder, population density for age of first marriage. Well, let's do that one. You know, uh, we can do it with GDP per capita. We can do it like that. Look at that. Ooh, that's really strong. Wealthier countries, people tend to... Um, uh, wealthier countries and people tend to marry older. Oh, we can do, you know, we can scoot over here. Population density, age of first marriage, something going on there. Not really. So you can imagine that there are hundreds of combinations with the relatively few variables I have. Hundreds and hundreds of combinations. No one wants to do all that. But Excel has something built in. If you go into data, all the way on the right, you should see data analysis. If you don't see data analysis, do not panic. Go to File. Go to all the way at the bottom, you see Options. Go to Add-ins. And wait for Add-ins to come up. Eventually it will. There we go. And then at the bottom you see Excel add-ins, say go. And then you'll hit that analysis tool back. Note when I unclick it and say okay, then data analysis goes away. So I'll just do it again. File, options, add-ins, Excel add-ins, hit that go button. Analysis tool back. It doesn't really matter which one of these two you choose, between the VBA or not. Click OK, and it's back. If you click Data Analysis, it's going to give you more sophisticated options. Recall that with Excel, often our commands like it when there's only one output, when there's only one number that comes out, because then that number is going to be confined to a cell. That's what we encountered when we did confidence levels, right? And confidence intervals. I mean. That's what we encountered when we did confidence intervals. We couldn't get a confidence interval because a confidence interval is two numbers, an upper and a lower bound. When we put in that confidence function, we got a margin of error. That's one number. And then we had to add and subtract that to get the upper and lower bound. So Excel does not like having more than one output unless you use data analysis. Data analysis uh, lets you then have Excel do more complicated things where there's going to be lots of different numbers it generates, lots of different outputs. And so that requires this interface. We will have the option of telling Excel where to put this output of information. Whatever cell we select, it will form the upper left-hand corner of the table it will generate with all the information. Let's go to correlation, and I'll show you what I mean. Correlation. So the input range is going to be all of various variables. Note that they're grouped by columns by default, which means our variables occur in columns like they do now. 
column B is one variable, column C is one variable, column D is one variable, etc. I'm going to scroll all the way over and then all the way down. Oops, too far down. There we go. I think that's everything. Yep. Note I did not do the very first row because the very first row is my element. It doesn't really matter for these purposes, right? It's, it's words too, like I can't really want a correlation. I will, however, select this labels in first row. Very important. Make sure you do that, and you'll see why in a minute. For output range, I'm going to select that radio button because I want to tell it where the output is. Now I'm going to put it here in A240. And I picked A240, specifically I picked A, somewhere in A and somewhere below the data for a reason that will become clear. It's going to make it easier to read. Now again, that A240 is going to form the upper left-hand column. I'm sorry, the, uh, that A240 is going to form the upper left-hand corner of a table it will generate. And this table will be all the correlation coefficients that you can possibly create with this data. Hundreds and hundreds of them, and it does it in an instant. Isn't that great? So for one, note why I picked labels in first row. I picked labels in first row because then it takes those labels right here, and then it puts them down here and repeats it. So now it's very clear what I'm looking at. And the way to read this is you take a look at one variable like population, and then you look at agricultural land, and that cross section is the correlation coefficient between agricultural land and population. And we can just go across agricultural land and GDP per capita, slightly negatively correlated between, um, scroll up, uh, over 15, unemployment, positively correlated, da -da -da -da. Note also the reason why I put it in column A is because now this matches with my fixed line, with my fixed one right up at the top. So as I scroll down, even though I lose track of this, I still have it right here because that First column A is kept up with this, which is just a transposed version of this. <clears throat> so I can very easily see. Uh, not a lot of correlation there. Well, that was pretty good. BMI male and GDP per capita. Interestingly enough, not as strongly correlated as BMI female and GDP per capita. That's interesting. Note child out all and child out female and child out male is very strongly correlated, pretty strongly correlated with population. That's because this, uh, this variable right here is not adjusted for population. This is the total number of kids out of school, and this is the total number of people in a country. Quite frankly, I'm surprised it's as weakly correlated as it is. This, I believe, I don't know if that's adjusted for population. When in doubt, you can always check descriptions. So I have descriptions of everything. No, this is not just for population. Total kids killed by homicide. It's sad. So again, that's probably why it's pretty, but again, not as strongly correlated as you might think. Now you note that there's this line of ones right here. This line of ones is, you cross-reference it, it's population with population. So of course, every variable is going to be perfectly correlated with itself. <coughs> It's only really time we see a one like that. I'm going to talk about those down there in a minute. I'll talk about these in a minute. Uh, but this here, you notice, is all blank. And it's blank because it would be redundant if it was not blank. Take a look at this right here. This is GDP per capita and population. Well, this area right over here, the, uh, the mirror image of it, is also GDP per capita and population. Just that population is first and GDP per capita is second. Okay. It's arbitrary which one you put it in, right? It didn't matter if we were to do correlation coefficient of one of variable A and, and then comma variable B, and then we did again correlation coefficient variable B comma variable A, you would get exactly the same result. It's totally arbitrary which one is first and which one is second. So that's why this area right here is blank, because this area right here is redundant with this area over here. 
So agricultural land, you see eventually we hit this one point agricultural land. And then if we want the, the variables um, after agricultural land, then we have to go down this one. Agricultural land with aid given, agricultural land with aid received, agricultural land with alcohol consumption, average aid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So far, so good. We have two, though, really interesting points of interest, or two areas, I should say, that are really interesting. Let's start with this one. You have a divide by zero thing. What's going on there? This is aid received as a percent of GNI, which is a gross national income. It's a kind of a measure of how wealthy a country is. And that's the one aid given as a percent of GNI. Now, why do you suppose that's divided by zero? It's divided by zero because it's only going to find this correlation coefficient based on the observations that overlap with each variable. So we have a bunch of variables, a bunch of observations, I should say, where we have the population and the GDP per capita. But we don't have any variables which overlap between aid received and aid given, right? There's no observation. I mean, there might be, but there's, there's no, there's certainly not more than one observation. And there's probably, quite frankly, zero observations where a country both got aid and gave aid where the country received aid, foreign aid, and at the same time, the country gave someone else foreign aid. Like, wh what's going on? Countries only give other countries foreign aid if the country is wealthy enough to give foreign aid. Countries don't get foreign aid in the same year that they give it. That would have to be some really fast growth. They get foreign aid and they're all really terrible growth. Uh, a really dramatic change from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, maybe. but. Generally speaking, it's just not going to happen. So the fact that we have a divide by zero, that error message, it just says like we have no data to work with. You also get that error message if there's only one observation that they have in common. You can't really get a correlation coefficient with just one observation. What's going on? I don't know. Could be anything. Now let's take a look at A given as percent of GNI. We have what appears to be incredibly strong correlations. We have three negative ones and, a, uh, and one positive one. What's going on there? That means these are perfectly correlated. David said that wouldn't happen, and it totally did. It did because you're being fooled. Zero observations mean Excel can't figure out what's going on, obviously, because it's nothing to work with. One observation means Excel can't figure out what's going on. Two observations means there could potentially, you know, it, it looks like mathematically, it looks like a positive correlation. Or it looks like a negative correlation. And remember what I said about perfectly positive and perfectly negative correlations. If you can draw a line, a straight line, and hit all the observations, you're going to get a negative one or a positive one. Well, I drew a line and it hit all the observations, all two of them. And so it gets a positive one or a negative one, depending on how the data looked. Obviously, this is not helpful. Right? By definition, if you have two points, you can draw a straight line between them. That's a mathematical proof. There's no getting around that. So remember what I said. If you see perfectly positive or perfectly negative correlation, it's either you did something super boring, population is perfectly correlated with itself, or someone screwed up. You don't have enough information. You didn't really find anything interesting. This is not helpful, especially since and I want to point out, especially since if it was slightly higher, if it was uh, slightly like that, that's perfectly negatively correlated. But if it was slightly lower, you know, if it was a if this, if this observation was slightly above, 
The other observation, we get this very slight upward sloping curve. Now it's perfectly positively correlated because it's a straight upward sloping line or a straight downward sloping line that's hitting all those observations, right? Obviously, totally worthless. So immediately we can see that aid received per se given of GNI as it relates to um, underemployment 15 or for females or whatever, this is not helpful. And you can even see that too in the data if you scroll up. Look how blank, look how look how little we know about this, this data right here. We don't have a lot of observations. It's kind of surprising that we even got two observations overlapping. So we immediately know this is not really worth paying attention to. But note, two observations always leads to some Assuming they're slightly upward or even slightly downward sloping, it always leads to a perfect correlation, it always leads to an exact number, either negative one, one, or zero. Always. It has to. But if you have three observations, which really isn't that much better than two, you wouldn't be able to immediately identify it because it would be one of these numbers. It would look just like any one of these numbers. It wouldn't be a clean one, a clean negative one. So you do have to be aware of that potential problem. You always have to look at the number of observations. It's really important in statistics. That's going to conclude our conversation of correlation and correlation config, uh, coefficients. Next, we're going to take that next step and we're going to start deriving something called a linear regression. And that's going to be really cool.